think I can see that, yeah. Oh, I'm ready, yeah. For 17 days, you have to be mentally and physically strong. All the practice. All the sacrifices. It's every snooker player's dream to walk out onto that stage. To be Betfred World Snooker Champion. To be Betfred World Snooker Champion is everything. Hello and welcome to a special show from the Betfred World Snooker Championship. Here is what's coming up. We were like a poor man's night too. <laughs> yeah. Three, two, one, you're back in the room. <laughs> All that and plenty more to come then, but let's now hear from the 2022 Betfred at World Snooker Championship runner-up with Rob Walker. Well, what an incredible final and what an attempt at a comeback from Judd Trump. Judd, congratulations on turning that into a truly enthralling final, even though you finished up as runner-up. It was a tough game. I mean, I left myself a bit, a bit too much to do, but um, I just went out and, and tried to take some uh, inspiration from Mark Williams' performance against me, just tried to dig in and make it as tough as possible. So in the end, I just wanted to, him to sort of work for it and not give it to him. And he ended up making uh, a brilliant break off, off nothing, really, in the last frame. So there's, there's not much you can really do about that. You should be really proud of that performance because from 12-5 down, many players would have wilted against him and yet you played so well this afternoon that when we came back tonight the big comeback was still possible and still on did you feel you could overturn 14 11 yeah I, I thought um, there, there was still a great chance I was still in it there's still a long way to go he, he needed four more frames so I thought if I could keep him around 14 15 frames then I'd, I'd be in it but I made quite not a slow start, but my long putting was good. I just wasn't scoring heavy enough. And after the first two frames went by, I knew it was going to be, be really tough to get back into it. But still, I, I knew that I can sort of rattle off two or three frames in, in, in quick succession and um, make it into a game. But in the end, he made a brilliant break in the last frame. And the atmosphere on the arena floor was incredible. There was a fantastic uh, embrace. Obviously, huge respect between the two of you. It was a moment of history for snooker out there, wasn't it? Yeah, it's a very special moment, and um, it's always been a dream of mine to, to play him in, in the World Championship final. So, um, even though I lost, um, it's disappointing. But just to be able to feel that, I didn't um, at times ever expect to play him in the final. So, especially this year with the way I've been playing, it, it was um, just a bonus to be there. I just tried to enjoy every single moment of, of it, and, and I really did. And. We sometimes don't always see a huge amount of emotion from Ronnie at the end, but you could tell instantly how much finally matching Stephen in lifting this magnificent trophy seven times, how much it meant to him, couldn't you? Yeah, I could see it after he potted the, the winning balls. He, I think he was just sort of holding it back a bit. Um, but it's just so it's so much hard work that goes into it and, and that no one sees behind, behind the scenes. Um, it, and obviously he likes to play it down a little bit as well. So it's truly hard to gauge how much it means to him, but you could just see. Um, and I think it was nice for him to kind of, um, he probably did try to hold it and it just, just come out. So it was good just to see his natural reaction and see how much it actually means to him and how hard it is to, to do that. Because with his talent, it's, taken, it's still taken 30 years. So it's incredibly tough to get to seven. And you've been really honest in your assessment of your own game this season and you've said you know you haven't always hit, hit peak form but you've had a great campaign overall fantastic win in the champ of champs the 147 en route to the Turkish Masters and despite not being at your best you've made another world championship final so it's a positive position from which to launch into next season once you've had a holiday yeah, in the end, it's turned into a decent season. There's been, I think, four finals, two wins. Um, not played at my best, but still managed to dig in, in in all the tournaments, really. So I think this tournament was a bonus. I just uh, I didn't really get into sort of into top gear at any, any point throughout the whole tournament. So to 
kind of make a game of it against Ronnie was, was pleasing for me. An amazing win against Mark Williams, um, McGill, Bingham. They, they were all tough, tough, tough wins. And I was just happy to be in the final. Um, and, and I'd have liked to have made it a, a closer game. But in the end, I, I give it my all. It just wasn't to be. No, it, was, it was a great contest. Now, I know you're an absolute animal on the practice table, but are you going to give yourself a proper two-week boys' holiday? Do we need to warn some destination around the world that Trump and co are coming? Uh, I mean, yeah, I've got three or four days. I've got an exhibition this weekend. I've got two exhibitions next weekend. So not too much time off. But, um, yeah, I'll have, a, I'll have a break away for, for a few weeks. But, yeah, I mean, when, when you lose a game like that, you just want well for me I want to get back on the practice table work harder and, and try and sort of replicate what he's doing so there's still um, still a level when Ronnie played well throughout the, the whole tournament I think he was the best player and, and thoroughly deserved his win spoken so graciously I hope you do get a holiday you've covered yourself in absolute glory you made such yeah, a great match of that final thank you Judd have a great break see you next season cheers mate thank you all the talk at this year's Betfred World Snooker Championships has been about the famed class of 92 with Mark Williams, John Higgins and Ronnie O'Sullivan all booking their places in the semi-final. Let's join Sean Murphy and John Virgo then as they talk about this snooker trinity. OK, Sean, well, the class of 92. We had three in the semi-finals. I know we've got one left and it's your Trump changing the guard. But what about the three of them, Ronnie, Mark and John? It's unbelievable, isn't it, their yeah. longevity? Um, I wasn't a massive believer in this whole class of 92 thing, yeah, you know, it's kind yeah. of done the rounds over the years. I wasn't really a, you know, a massive like believer of it. I didn't sort of get involved in it. I think it was just the way it was. But uh, this week, having seen what we've seen yeah, with the yeah, three yeah. of them getting yeah. to the semis, um, they've converted me. Uh, I'm, but I, I can't get over just, you know, how they keep producing it, especially here. Yeah, yeah. And I think also, I mean, it was a special thing to see them there. But when we consider, Mark Williams played in the seniors a few years ago because he thought he couldn't hack it on tour. Yeah. Uh, John Higgins was talking about retirement a couple of years ago. Yeah. To get revitalised, you think Ronnie might be the key that keeps him going? I think so. I think his longevity on a personal front, the fact he's so fit and healthy and keeps trying to break the records, despite him saying he's oh, not yeah, bothered yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, we, we all, all know, take that. We all know he, yeah, we all know he, does, he is. Of course he does. Um, keeps them going. He keeps raising the bar year yeah. on year. And, yeah. you know, he's just got back to world number one. Even before that, I think we all still accepted he's still oh, the best player yeah, in yeah, the yeah, game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and certainly for my generation, which came, you know, some years after, he's still the bar. Yeah, yeah, and We yeah, all yeah. still look to yeah. him. And I suppose uh, you can say the three of them in the bar, really, absolutely, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, especially after what they've done this week. Yeah. Um, of course, we forget that in, like, I think it was 16, 17 and 18, you know, Higgins was in three finals back-to-back. -back. Now, oh, he didn't win yeah. any of them. No, I know. But I know. to do that alone on the bounce, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it was amazing. Their, their longevity, their skill, their talent, just one of them to come through yeah. would have been unbelievable. Yeah. Three of them at once. Yeah, it's remarkable. Unbelievable. The only thing I temper it with, uh, you, you, you know, because you seem to forget, when I was a young lad coming up, you know, playing the snooker club, they always used to say you didn't reach your peak at the game until you were 35. Yeah. And then when you see Ronnie come along in the UK at 17, Stephen, and... But maybe that is still relevant. And I mean, I know they're in the 40s, 60s now, but 35, when you've learned all the moves and how to handle the pressure, maybe that's the, one of the reasons it's given this longevity. I think that that's a key, and it doesn't get talked about, is that as the younger generation have come through, you know, we've got the Judd Trumps, we've got the Jack Lazowskis, um, you know, with the Luca Brussels, the new guys coming yeah. through. Um, they play a slightly more attacking open game yeah. than the yeah. class of 92, yeah. who, who, as you say, have learnt the moves, they've yeah, done the trade. absolutely. And it gives them the opportunity to just tie these young pretenders up a little bit. Yeah. And that has lengthened their careers. You're right, when I was growing up, it, we, we were told you don't reach your peak until your mid-30s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was then proven the other way with Hendry and people yeah. like that, who just took the game apart and was retired by his yeah. mid-30s. Done, dusted, yeah. never yeah. to be seen yeah. again. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the way they just keep changing, they, they're like the Madonna. They just keep reinventing themselves. They, they, they do reinvent themselves. And I also think as well that you get these young players that if they're not doing it in the mid-20s, they sort of panic sets in that they're never going to make it. You know, rather than, but if you are getting results, you'll have that longevity because you're learning all the time. But 
it's easy to switch off at this game. I said, I'm not going to make it, isn't it? Very much so. You know, you, you know. look at Ronnie Burst on the scene at 17 and won the UK champs. You know, Stephen Hendry was the world's youngest ever world professional champion at 21. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, Mark Williams, John Higgins have just been breaking records all their career. And for the younger players coming through, it's very easy to compare yourselves to that and think, well, I'm not at that level. I'm not no, there. No, I'm not no, where no. they were. But you can only really compare yourself to what you're doing. Yeah. You can only do your best. And, and, and don't set the bar too high for yourself, even though set, they set a very high bar. But as we've seen with John Higgins and Mark Williams, how they, as you say, they've reinvented themselves in the last few years. They keep coming and they keep yeah. adapting their game. Just this tournament, Mark Williams came into it saying that he changed his game. He tried to move away from being a floater yeah. to being a bit more of a hitter. Yeah. He widened his stance, trying to change his technique to accommodate yeah. that, going for his shots a bit more, mm. change the way mm. he break builds to mm. fit in with the modern game. Yeah. So they're always trying to change and improve. Yeah, and every credit, I mean, his performance. Uh, OK, the first session against Judd, lost 7-1, obviously that will always define as what cost him the match. But after that, he played unbelievable. If you take that session out of the equation, he was actually well ahead in the match. Yeah, Just that yeah. one bad session. Yeah. Uh, as we've seen a lot in these in these longer matches and with the multiple sessions, they're all like li little mini matches mm. of their own. Mm. And if mm. you lose one of them heavily, it can just Oh, you play you. catch up. But no, you've got to take your hat off. They're absolutely... And, and the most important thing from my point of view, the they're a credit to the game, you know, and you, you need icons that people can aspire to, you know, and uh, yeah, fantastic. And they have inspired, you know, myself, Maguire, I think Selby, Robertson, a few others came through a few years later. We were the class of 98. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. Uh, we were like a cheap man's 92. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, funnily enough, I was commentating on the Welsh and uh, Joe Perry beat Judd, actually, in the final. And I'm sort of looking out to finish the commentary, you know. And then I looked and I noticed that Joe Berry turned pro in 92. Yeah. And I said, well, it might be a surprise the way he's played tonight. That's only his second ranking event. Yeah. But when you consider he turned pro in 92, the competition he's had to be knocking his head against all his career. Unbelievable. You know, his timing. It's a bit like we say about, they used to say it in golf, you know, we take Tiger Woods out of the equation. How many more tournaments would Phil Mickelson have won? How many more would Ernie Els have yeah, won? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. At their absolute peak, they were kind of lucky to be inspired to be in the same era as Woods, but also a little bit unlucky that they had to go out and well, compete uh, against well, him. Well, well that is the bottom line, yeah. You know, as I said to Steve Davis, uh, I was in the players' lounge the other night, and he was saying about all these gigs he's got because he's now thunder muscles and he's a DJ, you know. I said, why didn't you turn to that in the 80s? Give us a chance. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you think is it about it with uh, the class of 92? You think a lot of players, when they rock up to play them, a lot of players, even the great players on tour, are beaten before they start. Well, absolutely. But that's always been the case. You know, in the early days when uh, Reardon, Spencer, you know, they had that psychological edge. I mean... You find, I mean, with Jimmy, I mean, when he used to be playing, he'd go out and, he, like, people were giving him 14 start, you know, because of the presence of him. And then when you lose that edge, then people don't have any respect. And these three have got that respect now and always will have. The Betfred World Snooker Championship is a 17-day marathon. And over those two and a half weeks, we're all bound to get a bit snooker loopy. Snooker loopy, that's a win. Three, two, one, you're back in the room. <laughs> Day four, and it's already hotting up here at the Betfred World Snooker Championship. It's day three. Balls. All right, all right. Don't give me excuses, just give me results. Anyway, enough of my moaning. What sort of things? Is it sort of safety game that he's been helping you on? Or? I, I don't want to tell you. <laughs> Stephen, there was lots of lots of chanter in there. Is there um, under your breath during the match we saw on the TV? Is there anything you can repeat? Well, obviously, I can't repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Shane. Thanks. <laughs> What's your first memory of John Higgins? Do you remember when you were growing up as a kid? Uh, nice guy. Nice smell. Uh, nice smile, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and we, you, you said we could choose you a full fit if you want to get <laughs> uh, so on. It has been discussed. Yeah, I thought it might be. Running a marathon to wearing a bet. <laughs> <laughs> wearing a bet Fred Mankini. Have you had any thoughts about it yourself? Oh, my well, a marathon. Oh, my God. What can I do it over a week? Well, I never. 
There is a pigeon. Yes, you've heard that correctly. There is a pigeon in the Crucible Theatre. It's the first time it's ever, ever known anything like that happened. I mean, I don't even know how it got in. I was saying to Martin Clark, if it sort of done a number two on the table, what would be the situation? I mean, we can't carry on. Ain't got time really to get it recovered. Thankfully it didn't. We've seen some things at the Crucible before, but we've never seen that. Certainly in Betfred. Betfred, they are better hounds for the Guinness and the Peroni. But you know, we, we make sure we have plenty. <laughs> Yeah, right, let's do the Purell at night. Could we all? You look shattered. Oh, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> you look great. <laughs> I'm shattered as well. It was a long night. <laughs> you look good. So. Thanks. <laughs> but you're in the next round. That's all I'm at. That's all I'm at. You're right. You're right. Well, congratulations. Just about it. Cheeky <laughs> bastard, <laughs> isn't As you can see, things do get a little bit potty around here. Right, whilst we wait for our champion, mm. let's just recap what else we've got to look forward to in the show. You could meet Alex Higgins and within half an hour you, were, you had this unbearable notion that it would be really pleasant to hit him on the nose. This is one of the greatest events. I love being here, I love being at the Crucible. It's like the venue is built around the snooker table. It's amazing. Right, now is the time you've been waiting for. Let's join Rob Walker and hear from the 2022 Bet Fred World Snooker Champion. Wow, what a night, what a 17 days. The record breaker, the history maker. Ronnie, felt like history tonight. It was incredible. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure what it felt like. I was just, I just, all I felt, I was involved in a, a titanic battle with a strong competitor who's a young, hungry, amazing player. And I just had to do all I could to do and fight for every point, every inch. I didn't give an inch on anything, you know. And uh, that's, 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 that's what it felt like to me, you know. He played so well from 12-5 down mm. because so many opponents mm. would have wilted against mm. you at that stage. Mm. And yet, you know, he, he forced the match to go all the way and he, he made you earn it. Oh, I had no doubt that he would. Um, even at 12-5, I was sitting there thinking, well, how, how have I got such a lead on someone like Judd? It was just, you know, but I never for once thought it was over because, you know, he's a champion and champions never quit, you know. Never seen such a long embrace at the end. What was said between you should remain private. Yeah. But it was so mm. obvious that mm. there was a fantastic moment of respect mm. from both of you. Yeah, no, listen, Judd, Judd said some things to me and, you know, um, that mean a lot. And I didn't realise that he felt and, you know, and that Harry, you know, our, our relationship has been and, you know, we get on great. But obviously, you know, it's, um, yeah, it was, it was, that was just, that's, that's what done me. That's what done me more than anything. Not winning. It was just what he said to me at the end, you know, I just gave him a big hug because I was relieved. But then when I just got into his arms and he just had such beautiful words to me and I knew he meant it and it come from the heart and I just thought, bloody hell, mate, you're doing me in here. You're doing me in. And then um, he, sh he showed what a, what a man is, what a man is, you know. So absolute top respect for Judd. He's a, he's a great lad, great, great, great for the sport. He's just a brilliant guy, an amazing player. Snooker's lucky to have him. Well, and you as well. Mm. Uh, were you surprised at how much emotion you felt at the end? I was quite, I've, I've been quite emotional uh, the last f three or four years, to be honest with you. I think as you get older, you start to. Um, but no, I, d I don't know. It's just, I don't know. It's just, it's just there it is, isn't it? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I just, weird, weird, mate. And it's just amazing that you could tell the, the what, there's always a wave of emotion for you, but even more so tonight from the fans and your mm. dad there mm. and your son there, your daughter. It, it mm. just looked and felt like the complete moment. Yeah, well, I mean, it's like my dad's obviously trained me from a young age to. to to, to be as professional and as dedicated as I could because I was, I was a bit of a lazy lazy kid really and uh, you know what he's been through and what the family went through it was tough you know um, at times and um, we like to keep a low profile because my dad's respectful obviously to the to the other family that was involved so he, he never likes to be in the limelight but you know um, I said come down enjoy the two weeks here um, in Sheffield you're going to have a great time Lily and Ronnie came down fantastic to see them they're going to have a great time and it's just nice it's just nice to share it with, with the family you know 
greatest moment of your career? Uh, one of, one of, yeah, I'd have to say probably the greatest, uh, the, probably the best win of my career, you know, I'd have to say that, you know, because I, I felt like I played all right. I felt like I played all right from start to finish and uh, and I had to fight for it. And yeah, no, it's a uh, yeah, marvellous, marvellous moment. Yeah. Are you as proud of your longevity as the achievements themselves? I mean, look, 01, 04, 08, yeah. 12, 13, 20, 22, that, that is some list of seven. Yeah, no, listen, the, the longevity thing is, is good, you know, but there's there's times, you know, I, I, I get great joy out of turning up. I'm, I'm, I'm 46, I'm fit, I'm healthy, I'm playing against a lot of guys that are early 20s up until mid 30s in their prime, and they're they're forcing me to keep fit, to keep healthy, to to to, to have a sensible schedule because I can't. I can't recover like these guys do. I have to kind of be a bit smart about the way I go about my business now. Um, but, you know, I, I enjoy the battle. It, like I said, it's a bit like Tiger Woods. You know, he, he, ca he can't do what these guys do on tour, but he can still pitch it up and play. And if he gets it right on the week, he can still get into the to, to the to the nitty grit, gritty part of the, of the tournament. So, you know, we play for different reasons now. You know, I don't, I don't expect to win titles like I did. Far from it. But, you know, if I have a good run and I enjoy my time while I'm away, that's a victory for me, you know. It's been fascinating watching the documentary guys go about their business. They've, they've been in here in the press mm. room. And we were talking to them, for some players, that might add pressure and, and crush them because they're thinking, hang on a minute, I've got a crew following me, I've got to win the title. <laughs> I wonder with you whether it was actually helpful having them. Well, I, I, I didn't... Um, the, the, the idea of doing this wasn't about me trying to win the World Championships. The idea was is that, you know, they felt I was an interesting enough character to kind of explore and look at my history of where I started, what I've done in the game, and, and follow me and, and, and follow the journey, you know, whether that whether I won tournaments or not. It wasn't really, that wasn't in the plan, you know. It was more about, you know, we, we, we want to do it. We, we think it's, we think you're worth following. So I was like, okay, let's do it, you know. So, I, you know, I did warn them, don't expect me to win anything, because, I you know, I'm, it's, it might not happen. But um, it was more about an insight into what it's like for a professional sport sportsmen to go through what they go through and how they live their life and hopefully for the viewers that will watch it they'll maybe get a bit more of a bit of better understanding and see see what it's like you know uh, and and it'll be a wonderful advert for all your hard work and a great advert for our sport ronnie mm. it's been an honor for all of us to have witnessed history tonight many many congratulations thank you, thank you very much Cheers, mate. thank you yeah Excellent. done, yeah. done. Cheers, thank you Sadly, this is the final Betfred World Snooker Championships, but it has been a fantastic 12 years, and most of this would not have been possible without the brilliant Crucible staff. It's our 50th year of the Crucible, and this one, like no other, especially having the last two years of running pilot events during COVID, it feels like we've got to some sort of normal again. We're back to kind of our old selves, which is really, really nice. Um, because it's been a long, long haul to get to this point, really. It's it's brighter, and um, we we're really lucky to have come through and come on the other side of the past two years. People are starting to want to come back in to see live theatre, and it's just great that this is our fiftieth year. It's the place where Stephen Hendry, you know, played and won seven world championships, and Steve Davis and where Alex Higgins, that memorable moment when he, he took Lauren in his arms and cried and he won the World Championship. I think you can definitely feel that that's part of what this is. It's not just a snooker event, it's a, it's a piece of history. What's brilliant for me about it is the magic of seeing people queuing up outside and entering the doors of the Crucible. There's a magic moment there. When I'm at home and I watch snooker, I just see the seats, I see I see everything and I just feel really privileged to be working here because the it's just it's just great. I, I don't even know how else to explain it and a, a lot of my friends they're just envious that I work here. I, I don't think there's anywhere better. It's a part of history, it's part of the nostalgia of snooker. Every time I'm out there I just think all the, the, the moments that happened. Davis and all that and Ronnie Sullivan made that break and John Higgins done this. And... Still get the same butterflies. Still. I still get the same feelings that I had when I first turned up here in 1995. This place, when you get to one table, semi-final of this World Championship, 
It's like the venue was built around the snooker table. It's amazing atmosphere. People see obviously two snooker tables on the TV, but behind the scenes, the amount of incredible work and the amount of equipment that rolls into the crucible, into the TV compound, there's thousands and upon thousands of cables that come in. Um, yeah, flight, you know, thousands of flight cases, hundreds of people buzzing around getting this event ready for what it, what it is. We have a lounge for the players and presenters. We also have the sponsors lounge as well, so it's not just kind of what you see on the surface out here, but there's a lot of things going on backstage. The sales team, the front of house catering that are all running the World Snooker, who a few months ago were, we were hosting Anna Karenina on the stage, but whilst we've got snooker, we've got a massive two-week tour of Six the Musical across the road and our teams are working this, running over there and running that so we're, we're ready for all of it. And sometimes the first match finishes and there's only 20 minutes between the next one and getting the audiences out and getting them back in it's just exciting. We have people that have been, to, been coming to snooker for a long long time who've married on the crucible stage um, and whilst we talk about we're hosting the world snooker at the moment and our teams are doing the most incredible job from the cleaners that are turning up at silly o'clock to make sure this venue is pristine when we open the doors and staying late to ensure that we're ready for the following day. Some of our casual staff come back only for snooker period because they like the atmosphere then. For a lot of them they actually take holiday from their uh, normal daytime job to then come and work all day here because everybody loves the atmosphere and people arriving you can you can feel that energy and that excitement about not only they coming to see the world championships they're, they're coming to the crucible it's like they've arrived on a journey to, on a sort of a, a pilgrimage when the um, the partition comes down at the beginning of the first session it's just great the atmosphere with um, all the commentators and everything it's just amazing with world snooker and bet fred you know they they're brilliant, they make our lives really easy. It's, it's such a nice group of people to kind of come and, and take over the building for, for three weeks, four weeks, so it's always nice to have them back. There's so much passion here for us hosting the snooker and I just have, the, my pride is off the scale for the teams that are working here and delivering 2022 whilst preparing to go on sale with 2023. Nothing, nothing is big for us, we just sort it Issue comes up, we deal with it and we move on. From the stories from the Crucible staff to the man who lived and breathed at snooker. His book, My Life, is out right now, so let's hear from Barry Hearn on his favourite snooker memories. Well, obviously it has to be 1981 when my life changed, arguably snooker's life's changed. Uh, and Davis's life changed. It's when Steve Davis, my prodigy, you might like to call him, but really my mate, won the World Snooker Championships. And uh, a day, a night, uh, an event that I will never forget as long as I live. You know, there are bits and pieces. I think I've, I've, I've tried to capture the, the moments in my life where something changed because of it, you know, and or where lessons were learnt because of certain situations. So the fundamental parts, you know, the really big things in my life are, are all in there. The danger is, like people and stories, when you've been going as long as I have, you know, there are literally thousands upon thousands because every day's a story in sport, isn't it? We're dealing with characters, we're dealing with events, with, re with drama, we're dealing with loyalty. I mean, there's so many different aspects of it. Um, we only left a couple out on the lawyer's advice because someone would definitely have sued me if I told the truth. We were going to leave three out, but, but one of the three died. So the lawyer said, he's dead, you can put that in now, it's all right. So we'll see, but I hope I've been honest. That's the most important thing. It took three and a half years to do. I didn't really want to just knock out, a, you know, Baz has gone, here's a quick edition of his life. So there's a lot of thought gone into it. Whether or not people like it, I don't really care because I like it. I mean, there's not too many stories about Steve because he was always so dull and boring. He just won, didn't he? He just turned up and won. Interesting Steve Davis, the man who's, for his 40th birthday, I bought the original puppet from Spitting Images for him and I found to my horror that the puppet had more personality than Steve mm -hmm. Davis. So he's got used to me pulling his leg on that because it was a fair reflection. 
Alex Higgins. Of course, if you if you start with stories about Alex Higgins, we really will be a long time. But you know, the difference with Alex is he was the the original Jekyll and Hyde of snooker. You could meet Alex Higgins, and within half an hour, you were, you had this unbearable notion that it would be really pleasant to hit him on the nose, hard. And then half an hour later, you could think he is the nicest, sweetest, lovable person you've ever met. He could change just like the wind. Some of it was alcohol induced, but I think it was just, it, Alex wanted to be loved. That's why he was such a showman, you know? Why he played shots that other people didn't even know about was because he wanted to entertain. Unfortunately, he wasn't a consistent winner. So when the history of snooker, no one ever says Alex Higgins was the greatest snooker player, but he was certainly the greatest personality. I can remember plenty of times when he would walk down the aisle of a train that I was on and I would hide behind the copy of my newspaper because if you got him in one of his moods, it wasn't pleasant. So, you know, that's Alex for you. Jimmy White, well, just the lovable rogue of all time who's the same person now as he was when I first met him at 12, 13, 14 years old. He'd broken his leg, I seem to remember, the first time I met him and he was... Literally potting, he was hobbling around a snooker table, potting balls off a lampshade. He had so much talent, as did Ronnie O'Sullivan. I mean, Ronnie O'Sullivan, as a 12, 13, 14 year old, was a prodigy, you know. People would, you know, the, the whisper machine starts, you know, there's a kid playing over it. Gansiel Billiard, which wasn't one of mine. I remember he used to play in there a bit. Everyone was talking about him, you know. And you know, the funny thing about Ronnie is 40 years later, nearly, we're still talking about him. They get slaughtered, slaughtered. The game has come on so far. I mean, the personalities, everyone always talks about the absence of personalities today, but of course they're not. There are personalities out there. Ronnie O'Sullivan, Judd Trump, these are massive, massive personalities. There's probably more in-depth personalities because in those days to make a living you had to do snooker exhibitions or you had to mix with the public a lot more. Um, today's players are built to win. They're built to be machines and that doesn't involve necessarily a personality. It involves dedication, hard work, sacrifice. Um, but, you know, Bill Werbenick drank 16 pints of beer a day. You know, he, he became a personality. He didn't win the world championships. So, I think that the game is just unrecognisable from the, there's no little black book, but just look at the number of centuries, the, the competition amongst other players. Even a few years ago, people used to talk about, should, should we cut the size of the tour? And then people outside the top 64 started beating people inside the top 16. There's a huge amount of ability out there. You need a bit of luck. You need to have your day, you, to have your run. But we've seen a lot of first-time winners, you know, of people that have been l relatively lowly-ranked players. So the overall standard is incomparable to what it has been in the past. That doesn't mean to say that Stephen Hendry and Steve Davis wouldn't have adjusted to that scenario but it would have been a lot more difficult for them because the overall standard was unrecognisably better. It's a really tough question, what chapter, because obviously, as I said, it carries all the big moments. Um, I think it's the opening two pages, which just captures that moment of realisation when greatness is thrown at you. And the good man upstairs says, this game's going to change your life. And if it doesn't frighten you too much, like the granting of opportunity, then you grab it with both hands and you read the rest of the book. This tournament over the last 12 years has been one of the highlights of the sporting calendar for the Betfred team here at the Crucible. But for the boss himself, Fred, it's been a highlight of his entire life. Let me tell you about snooker. Snooker, I used to watch it avidly. Do you remember Pop Black? Remember that in, in those days? My wife was fanatical about it. We used to love doing it. And I always say that with sponsorship, you have to not only write checks out, you have to get behind it and work at it. 
and get get into the the bones of it and that's what we did with this and i believe we put 12 years in at the world snooker here very enjoyable 12 years and we've seen some great players here some great events and we've made some fantastic friends here at snooker with the players with the people at the crucible with the management teams and it's gone very smoothly and it's 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 our last but you know never say never i'd like to be back again and if uh, snooker ever want to put their hand up and say come and get have a talk with me fred we'll have a talk with them because it's been a wonderful time and a wonderful sponsorship. Man, how are you, Fred? I'm Great fine. to see you. You look well. Hello, Fred. Nice to meet you again. You well? Good, good. You know, it's been a privilege to, to, to be here. And that's my seat over there. Just to be able to sit there on the front row and watch this and get the jitters. I love snooker. I love the drama that it plays. When some of these boys are getting down to play, uh, the last shots of the game and the, the game depends on it. I don't know how they do it, I don't know how they hold the nerve. This is one of the greatest events. I love being here, I love being at the Crucible. This is our home. May Snooker ne final never ever go anywhere else than, than the Crucible. This is where it should be and so should Bet Fred. And let me just finish by saying I love Snooker. This wonderful city has been a second home for most of us for almost an entire month every year for the last 12 years. But that's it for the final Betfred World Snooker Championships. From everyone at Betfred, I'd just like to say a massive thank you. Thank you for watching and thank you for coming along on the journey with us. We are so proud to be associated with this iconic and historic championship. We hope it isn't goodbye because at Betfred, we love snooker. For 12 years, we've covered every ball, every frame, every match. We've celebrated every win. Commiserated every defeat. This is the semi finish from Tournament Snooker. We've been here from the first ball to the final black. To World Snooker, The Crucible Staff, BBC, Eurosport, IMG, The Press, The Fans, The People of Sheffield, and of course, The Players. Thank you so much for having us. For 12 years, we've lived snooker. We've loved snooker. We've breathed snooker. It's never goodbye. Betfred love snooker. Last one, shortest one, worst one. It's, it's going to be the best one. one. I can't believe it. I still can't believe it. Get it? I didn't, I didn't realise this was the last year of Betfred. I mean, they've been probably the best sponsors um, ever for the worst uh, championship. Thank you for your in my heart as well because he's been a great sponsor for the last like, 10 and 11 years. Thanks guys, you've been amazing. Great time. And thanks to Bet Fred, you know, for supporting this tournament over the years. You know, he's a top guy, Fred, and uh, we send all our best wishes to you, Fred. Top man. Yeah.